Okay, so oh. Thomas, I haven't seen you in several years. Yeah. <laughs> um, Thomas Hackenson is associate professor in the graduate critical and visual studies program at California College of the Arts. Thank you. <laughs> These last two seconds. He's a co-editor of the series uh, German Virtual Culture. He has published widely and received awards and fellowship from the United States and Europe. Yeah. So, thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it so much, Pero. Thank you so much. I have to say, I've, uh, it's lovely to be back here. It's always very nice to be uh, here at Stanford. Uh, this is my second time giving a laser talk. And I've, I have had to speak in some pretty tough situations. I have never, ever had to speak after somebody who's trying to cure cancer. So this is by far the most typical transition. Uh, I'm going to talk about art and an artist uh, for a little bit tonight, and a, and a particular kind of celebration of this artist, Kurt Schwitters, who is, um, uh, some of his work is just turning 100 years old this year, so I'm going to talk about Kurt Schwitters. So uh, this year, 2023, marks roughly the centennial of some of the avant-garde's most significant critical engagements with Western art and culture. The German artist Kurt Schwitters is now belatedly seen as a key figure to celebrate in this sense. He was prescient in 1930, declaring that, quote, the disquiet had only just begun, end quote. Prescient in 1930, not only about the uh, impending and expanded fascist aggression in Europe and elsewhere, but also in a more positive way. That is, Schwitter's contributions to radical aesthetic practice and artistic practice, which had yet to receive the significant scholarly and public attention they deserved, would become, after his death in 1948, in the post-war period, profoundly influential. So today I wanna to talk about Kurt Schwitters to celebrate the 100th anniversary of some of his most significant contributions to avant-garde artistic practice. Here, is it? Yes. Sure. Sorry, everybody, so you saw this quote from uh, uh, Kurt Schwitters, and then you saw, a, a this is just where I am right now, talking about the Matz publication. So I'll start again here. Uh, today I wanna to talk about Kurt Schwitters to celebrate the 100th anniversary of some of his most significant contributions to avant-garde art artistic practice, as well as to explain his particular brand of data and cultural resistance. First, we celebrate the anniversary of Merz, a journal he launched in 1923 and published for roughly a decade. Merz was not only the title of a magazine, an issue of which you see here, however, it was also the name of the one-person movement that Schwitters founded, a name that comes from the German word for commerce, Kommerz, uh, even though the word Merz by itself doesn't really make any sense whatsoever. And that was for Schwitters the point. The all encompassing project, the Gesamtkunstwerk, that was Merz, much like the magazine which took its name, sought to challenge through art the West's established norms, habituated quotidian practices, problematic social structures, and archaic cultural beliefs. So, not quite curing cancer, but trying to do a lot of work. Second, we mark in 2023, the 100th anniversary, not only of the periodical mats, but also two of Schwitter's other major contributions to Western avant-garde artistic practice. Here, there is his larger than life assemblage known as the Matz Bau, uh, roughly the Matz building, an always incomplete project started in the 1920s and abandoned in 1937 or roughly in 1937 when he fled the Nazis and eventually destroyed by allied bombing in 1943. The ongoing project of the Matz Bau, part three-dimensional collage, part architectonic experiment, part domesticated sculpture, part three-dimensional three-dimensional disorganized installation, was also known as the Cathedrale des Erotischen Elends, or in English, the Cathedral of Erotic Misery. What a lovely title for it! What what a lovely title for your apartment. The secondary title, The Cathedral of Erotic Misery, alludes not only to Schwitter's own struggles with normative ideas of gender and sexual expression, but also his efforts to subvert the taxonomic medical scientific discourses increasingly dominating Western self-understandings of individual and collective intimacies in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. The Merzbau, that monumental cathedral of erotic misery, destroyed in 1943, has lived on through stunning photographs like these taken in 1933, as well as the extensive artistic influence in the 20th and 21st centuries. In addition to celebrating, let me see if we can get that on, okay. In addition to celebrating 
the centenary of the beginning rumblings of his Cathedral of Erotic Misery, we also celebrate the anniversary of the sound of Schwitters. More specifically, 2023 marks about 100 years since the beginnings of Switter's experiments leading to his deconstructive sonic orchestral work, the mischievously titled Ua Sonata, or Original Sonata, a piece which he began sometime in 1922 or 23 and supposedly took about a decade to write, about 10 years to write. So at our Leonardo Art Science Evening Rendezvous at tonight's Lasers here at Stanford University, we celebrate not only approximately 100, the 100th anniversary of Kurt Schwitter's Merz publication, his Merz Bau and his Ua Sonata, but also the artist himself, his affiliations and disaffiliations with the Dada movement, his critical engagements with medical scientific discourses of sexuality and gender, and the ongoing influence as of, of his creative mind and creative spirit. After a brief biological sketch of the artist and the Dada art movement with which he is often identified, I outline in, in shortly the ways in which two of his most enduring creations, the architectural and installation construction known as the Matzbau and his deconstructive musical symphony for human voice only, the Ua Sonata, might be set in historical conversation with his personal provocations and uh, regarding sexual and gender expression. Collectively, these biographical, artistic, and cultural touchstones help exchange Kirchfitters and the space, sound, and sexuality of his unique brand of Dada resistance. Let me briefly explain Dada, the avant-garde artistic activities with which Kirchfitters correctly or incorrectly is still, are still often associated. The so-called anti-art movement of Dada is synonymous with avant-gardism itself. The, the idea that there is possible an advanced form of artistic expression, one that is critical of existing art forms and of, social, of the social status quo, which engenders them, and simultaneously, which these art forms help maintain. The avant-garde anti-art of Dada, for lack of a better word, started in 1916 in the Cabaret Voltaire in Zurich, Switzerland. The anarchistic ideas and revolutionary practices of Dada spread quickly throughout Europe, North America, and beyond in the early 20th century. Today, Schwitters is recognized as a decisive influence in post-war art in the West, specifically with respect to fluxes, as well as neo-Dada artists like Robert Rauschenberg, whose sculptural assemblage, assemblages known as the Combines clearly take Schwitters' early 20th century sculptural paintings as his inspiration. Yet, during his own time, members of the more politically oriented proponents of Dada in Germany rejected Kirchfitters as not political enough, not radical enough, not aggressive enough, and I think we might even say, given the gender politics of Dada and other early 20th century avant-garde movements like it, not man enough. Schwitters was, to be precise, denied affiliations with Dada in Berlin, the rejection, however, led Switters to begin his own version of avant-garde artistic practice, which he called Merz, in his hometown of Hanover. Depicted in 1921 in an illustration by H. O. Binder, Schwitters would appear to embody something of the dandy, a man who gives excessive attention to personal appearance, dresses in fancy clothes, and gives much too much over to how he looks. Given that Schwitters was the son of a skilled seamstress and of parents who owned a very successful ladies' fashion shop, the term dandy seems apt in this sense. But the term also seems appropriate in another iteration, for dandy also suggests very good or even excellent. And Schwitters was, among many things, expertly aware of his own time and aware of the future. He was, in both senses then, a dandy. This illustration, which I cite thanks to the work of art historian Maria Makala, and as Makala acknowledges further, that of Adrian Sudhalter, showcases a kind of non-gender normative flamboyance on Schwitter's part, even if this flamboyance is not something typically associated with the artist. In this illustration, titled Heilige Dada Hilf, or Holy Dada Help Me, from the January 1921 issue of the journal Jugend, Münchner Illustrierte Wochenschrift für Kunst und Leben, Youth Munich Illustrated Weekly for Art and Life, the oddest element of this illustration is not the depiction of Schwitters, who appears flamboyantly attaching material objects, wood, 
spools, cutouts, and the like to a so-called painting he is making. He really was pounding things into wood, and he called them paintings, which is where the idea of Rauschenberg's combines come from, comes from. Rather, the oddest element in the title which Binder gives this illustration and the fact is the fact that it is Schwitters who seemingly becomes the poster child for Dada. At the time, Schwitters was seen by many as a failure, as a substitute, as a provocative figure who did not really fit the bill, as it were, as an artist or a man. Even contemporary scholars like Cole Collins argue that Schwitters should not really be considered a Dadaist at all. But much like several of his contemporary avant-garde artist colleagues, Schwitter's gender politics and even his intimate relationships were by no means normative. To be sure, many of the Western avant-garde movements in the early 20th century were decidedly male and often, often stiflingly masculine. For example, Hannah Hoech, the only cisgendered female member of the Berlin Data Group, can be seen in this photo, seated in the center left, seemingly annoyed by the crowd of mostly men around her. Right. However, certain data artists engaged in sexual and romantic relationships with both men and women, and to be even more precise in Hoek's case, non-gender conforming personalities like the Dutch artist and writer Till Bruchman. While others like Hoek's one-time one -time partner Raoul Hausman and his wife Hedda practiced polyamory, living in a heterosexual marriage, but also having separate or coupled relationships with other women. During Dada's early years, Hausman was even married to Hedda and openly having a separate intimate relationship with Hoech. Slightly later on, after he and Hoech separated, Hausman and Hedda lived in an open menage a trois with the Russian-born writer Vera Briodo. Hoech, without any trace of the animosity of a former lover, would describe Hausman's three-way relationship with Hedda and Vera as completely bourgeois, however. Such a description suggests just how slippery the slope was between sexual radicalism and middle-class conformity. The Hausman triad, Hecht noted to these ends, lived in a tastefully decorated apartment in the fashionable upper-class district of Charlottenburg in Berlin. The biographical bits of his early life suggest that Kurt Schwitter's father, was not an ideal role model for the kind of aggressive cisgendered male masculinity that would become so dominant among many of the avant-garde art movements emerging in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. While biographer Gwendolyn Webster suggests Twitters might be described as, as quote, tall, athletic, and self-assured, a classic specimen of the North German male, end quote, she makes clear that Schwitters embodied the kind of paradox that the Dada movement itself embraced. Quote, and this is Webster describing Kurt Schwitters. Schwitters was often enough not even typical of himself. He was an elusive and contradictory figure, a happily married womanizer, an enfant terrible of the avant-garde who never stopped painting academic pictures. A gregarious and enthusiastic self-publicist who deliberately sought rural anonymity a fearless proponent of abstraction, who ran a successful advertising agency, a middle-class vagabond who camped out in the houses of the wealthy and the distinguished, a man who could bravely face up to the harsh realities of life and yet display an almost frightening ability to run away from them, end quote. In addition to some of this potentially emasculating aspects of his biography alerted to in Webster's account, it's important to point out that Schwitter served for a time in 1917 in the military, but it was just was discharged due to health issues. He suffered, it seems, throughout his life from intermittent epileptic fits. His masculinity undoubtedly called into question during a period of rampant militarization and even among many other radical avant-garde artist friends who saw anything less than aggressive and pointed political art as weak, complacent, and domesticated. Contemporary scholars note the problematic roles Schwitter's gender and even his sexual identity played in the artist's creative efforts. Cole Collins, in his examination of Kurt Schwitter's gender politics, suggests that the artist was, quote, categorically heterosexual, but not heteronormative in the classical sense of the word. He had affairs and it seems didn't have anything to say negatively or otherwise when he encountered gay people, end quote. Maria Makala, in her compelling discussions of Switter's use of non-traditional materials 
and found detritus, situates Schwitter's artistic practice as one embracing fully the culture of the substitute, or in German, Herzatz. In many ways, Makala's explanation showcases one common feature of Schwitter's himself. He was often positioned by many, including other Dada artists, as illegitimate, as an illegitimate avant-garde practitioner, and by extension, not a real man. Schwitter's documented affiliations with other avant-gardists of the time, however, give credence to a reading of his work and his life as resisting normative gender and sexual expectations. For example, Schwitter's maintained active relationships with Dada artists such as Höch and Hausmann, who openly practiced disruptive gender politics and non-normative sexual relationships. In September 1921, Hausmann, Höch, Schwitter's, and Schwitter's wife, Helma, undertook an anti-Dada tour to Prague. It was here that Hausmann introduced Schwitter's to the idea of sound poetry, which the Hanover-based artist would then explore and expand further in numerous visual and sonic works. The two figures, Hausmann and Schwitter's, even began collaboration on a poetry publication near the end of Schwitter's life, a magazine called PIN, P-I-N, all capital letters, but Schwitter's death in 1948 stopped the project. Schwitter's also developed a somewhat passionate, albeit platonic, connection to Höch. Correspondences and occasional meetings between the two, completely non-sexual as far as archival and published materials suggest, reveal a passionate friendship between the married man from Hanover and the polyamorous Höch. For her part, Höch, after, after a brief but open relationship with Hausmann, married at the time, began a long-term partnership with a gender non-conforming cisgendered female Dutch writer, Till Bruchmann. Hoek and Bruchmann, shown here, collaborated as well on numerous creative projects in the 1920s and 1930s. It was not only in his lived personal life that Schwitters explored non-normative relations. Such explorations were also active, uh, active parts of his creative practice as well. Perhaps his most famous architectural, spatial, and sculptural intervention, itself a highly suggestive sexual piece, was his Meritzbau apartment in Hanover. The space, transformed by Schwitters over many months of experimentation, was a sight beyond belief. Known among art historians as one of his, quote, absurdist architectural assemblages, end quote, the Meritzbau apartment in Hanover, and later works like his Meritz Barn in England, occupied 25 years of the artist's career until his death. Images of the Meritzbau taken in 1933 and shown here demonstrate the incredibly complex nature of this artistic piece. It is part sculpture, part collage. It is also part installation and part architectural reimagining. Difficult as it is to sense just how disorienting visiting the space might have been, let alone living in the Meritzbau, which Schwitters, his wife, and his son did for a time. These photographic reproductions give a sense of the impact of such purposeful disorientation on visitor and viewer alike. The Cathedral of Erotic Misery, as it was known, suggests how rethinking relationships to intimate spaces, to domestic spaces, to oneself in relations to one's physicality and to others and other spaces might just call into question gendered and sexualized expectations of normalcy and abnormalcy, domesticity and publicness. Placed in the historical and cultural context of the veritable tsunami of medical scientific treatises and taxonomies published in the name of medical science during the period, it might also be easy to see Schwitter's Meritzbau as itself a criticism of these individualizing, solipsistic, reductive forms of gender and sexual categorization. In Schwitter's Cathedral of Erotic Misery, one becomes physically, perhaps even socio-sexually disoriented. There is a libidinally charged secret to be discovered in every niche and an erotic mystery to behold around every angle. Schwitter's avant-garde interventions traversed from the material to the immaterial realms as well. More specifically, Schwitter's became a master of sound poetry and sonic disruption. His orchestral score for human voices was titled the Ua Sonata, or translated loosely into English, the original sonata. Supposedly taking over a decade to write and begun around 1923, the Ua Sonata deconstructs the basic elements of the traditional idea of a sonata, which is a piece written to be played by instruments rather than simply sung. 
The Ua Sonata uses only the human voice as the instrument. There are no violins, cellos, pianos, or trumpets. The entire work is roughly 41 minutes long when performed, but a few minutes of the only known recording of Schwitters performing the piece in 1932 gives a sense of the work's innovativeness and radicalism. In this version, the viewer can see the score of the Ua Sonata which is comprised primarily of a series of letters and diacritical marks. So I'm gonna play about a, a minute of this so you can hear and also see the Ua Sonata. And to do that, I think I have to stop sharing and do a new share so everyone can see, okay. And let me know if you see the text uh, also coming up in the, um, the Zoom, thank you. Okay, 41 minutes of that. Uh, we won't listen to all of it. <laughs> you get a sense if you've not heard it before, it's probably a little jarring. If you've heard it before, you know, it's just this amazing kind of collection of sounds and um, and a, really a deconstruction of, uh, of, of oh, oh, deconstruction. Oh, I got it. Rich Ritter's contributions to disruptive, non-normative artistic, cultural, and even gender and sexual expression were not fully appreciated during his time. Schwitter's 1930 suggestion that, quote, the disquiet had only just begun would prove apt not only in terms of the monumentous carnage of World War II, but also in terms of his artistic practice and his cultural reimaginings. Schwitter's decidedly immodest goal, one he noted early in his career, was, quote, establishing relationships, best of all, between all the things in the world, end quote. The posthumous rediscovery of Schwitter's work in the post-war period has helped generate a large amount of scholarly and artistic appreciation for just how radical and revolutionary he was. We, we should all have the goal of establishing relations, best of all, between all the things in the world. It's a wonderful goal. In, in retrospect, celebrating the 100th anniversary of some of his most significant creations, we can revisit Kurt Schwitter's as an artist and as a human, as a complex figure who embodies a certain kind of multidimensional rebelliousness. His aesthetic contributions um, collectively amounted to a one-person war on habituated and complacent perceptions, the acoustic radicality of his quasi-musical Ua Sonata, his numerous Mertz projects, his architecturally adventurous cathedral of erotic misery, his gender troubles, and his intimate allegiances give us reason to review in their centenary the space, sound, and sexuality of Kurt Schwitter's unique brand of Dada resistance. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sue. Yes, Kurt. Yeah, the milk style uh, is fun. really an intriguing space. <laughs> but I, I'm wondering, um, the image in my mind is that it's some sort of a combination of a physics lab with electron microscope, or a surgical operating theater, yeah. or maybe some factory. Was, was he collaborating with anyone? Um, Do you know what gave him some of these ideas? Uh, I, uh, he was uh, collaborating in a way with a lot of people. He was a bit of a kleptomaniac. And uh, one right. of the things that was happening was he was stealing little uh, pieces of memorabilia from a lot of his friends, his family, his okay. colleagues. And you can't quite get all the detail here. So this 
This was for a time, um, uh, the, the museum in Berkeley for a time had the reconstruction of the Matzbau in their facility. It's now in, um, I don't know if it's at MoMA, it's in storage at MoMA, they don't have it up. There's a reconstruction, but there are a lot of little niches. You can't quite see them in the details of these photographs. These photographs were sort of um, not, they were taken back a few feet from the structure itself. But there's little niches. Sometimes they're hidden over or built over. And if you would dig in, you would find someone's garter belt, for example, or someone's pocket watch. Previous visitor. Previous visitor, or you know, friends would say uh, Hannah Huth in particular, not to kind of uh, just emphasize her, but they were good, good friends. And she said one time she went to the uh, to the apartment in Hanover to visit him and discovered that he had stolen one of her handkerchiefs or something, and she found it in one of the little grottos of the Meritzbau. So. Um, Part you know the whole idea of of the cathedral of erotic misery had multiple uh, implications for Schwitters. So, um, but I mean the people who do architecture and and this still is a structure that gets talked about in installation art, obviously, but architecture as well because it just reimagined the domestic space in such an unusual, wild, radical way. Uh, and like I said, it was destroyed, unfortunately, the original in 1943 uh, bombing, uh, Allied bombing of Hanover. So. Thank you. <laughs>